Hello and welcome to my channel. This is Samrangi Roy and in this video I'm going to talk about four major poems that are attributed to the school of Kedman. The name of the poems are Genesis A and then we have an interpolated section which is Genesis B and then we have Exodus, Daniel and Christ and Satan. Now before we move on to discussing the contents of these poems, let me tell you something. This is going to be a longish video in which I'm going to discuss four major poems and their contents. And also there's something that you need to keep in mind before you jump straight into the plots of these poems. And that is the Junius manuscript, if you remember, uh, in my previous videos, I've talked about the four major manuscripts that preserve most of the Anglo-Saxon literature. The Junius manuscript is just one of them. And the Junius manuscript is the one that is attributed to the school of Cademan. Now, there are two books within the Junius manuscript, book one and book two. In book one, you'll find Genesis A, Genesis B, Exodus and Daniel. And in book two, you're going to find Christ and Satan. So whatever poems that you have under the Junius manuscript are based on the Holy Writ, that is the Bible. And therefore, we attribute these poems to the school of Cademan. Now, moving on to Genesis A and Genesis B. Genesis A is also known as the Elder Genesis. It was written in Old English. It was based on the first half of the biblical book of Genesis. Now fused to Genesis A is a passage known as Genesis B. So obviously it was interpolated by some other person, some other poet. You will find both of these poems Genesis A and Genesis B in the Junius manuscript which is preserved at the Bodleian Library at Oxford University. And there are many pages, many leaves that are missing from this poem. So there are many gaps and the poem as we have it is definitely not complete. Scholars are also of the opinion that Cademan was not the poet of Genesis A, that it was composed by some other Germanic poet. Coming to the content of the poem Genesis A, the poem starts off with a few lines in praise of God. After that, we see the happy lot of angels in heaven. What follows is the rebellion of Satan and his crew against God and then God getting very angry and casting them off to hell. After that, the space that was left empty in heaven after the expulsion of Satan and company, God decided to fill that place up with better people. And then he decided to create the world which would be a breeding place for these better people. And this part was borrowed from Pope Gregory the Great's interpretation of the fall of angels. Then we come to the creation of man. Now this part was borrowed from the Vulgate. So what is the Vulgate you ask? The Vulgate is nothing but Saint Jerome's Latin translation of the scriptures. That is the Vulgate. Saint Jerome's Latin translation of the scriptures. So this part was taken from the Vulgate. This is where the poem breaks off and we have gaps. Then we come to Genesis B, the interpolated section. So the beginning of Genesis B is lost. We do not have that. The pages are missing. What we have instead is an account of the temptation and fall of Adam and Eve. What follows is another version, another, you know, retelling of the fall of angels. And this version is a slightly longer one and written more efficiently. And then what is important is that we have Satan's speech to the fallen angels, which is very, very powerfully written with a lot of gusto uh, and uh, Milton's Paradise Lost, as most of you have already read, bears traces of this particular section from Genesis B. Then we jump straight to the poem Exodus. Now the date and the authorship of this poem is not known. Scholars and historians speculate that this poem was written around the 7th century. However, this poem is mainly about the flight of the Israelites from Egyptian captivity and then how they crossed the Red Sea under the leadership of Moses. Now, if you have read even the abridged version of the Bible back in your school, then you'll know the story of how Moses helped the Israelites cross the Red Sea by, you know, stretching his hand over the Red Sea and then the waters just divided and there was this passage and they followed the passage and like throughout their journey, there was this 
cloud that followed them and that cloud was supposed to be god and this cloud sort of it you know served as an obstruction which prevented the egyptians from uh, actually seeing what the israelites were up to or where they were going so this is basically the story and it starts with the revelation at the top of mount sinai where god revealed to moses the 10 commandments then we have the detailed description of the events that took place in egypt and what ultimately led to the israelites actually deciding to leave egypt and then how they crossed the red sea under the heroic leadership of moses and then obviously you have that you know moses stretching out his hand over the ocean and there's a meme on it which absolutely made me crack up so i'm going to share that meme uh, on this particular incident and then what happens is you know the main focus of this poem is on the passage of the red sea and uh, Moses obviously there are many speeches that are made by Moses speeches which are basically encouraging the Israelites stirring them up to perform deeds of valor and then we have the pursuing Egyptians and how after they had crossed the red sea that is the Israelites after they had crossed the red sea the water sort of rolled back again and the entire Egyptian army was destroyed there's also a battle scene between the israelites and the egyptians but that part is unfortunately lost so this poem uh, followed the english heroic tradition remember that it's very important now coming to the poem daniel here too we have daniel a and daniel b so daniel a was probably composed in c 700 at northumbria this poem bears no title in the manuscript at all This was the third and the last poem in the Junius manuscript and the text is divided into six fits. Right at the beginning of the poem we have this brief sort of introduction which is not very brief and which deals with the Hebrew history, the war with Nebuchadnezzar, the story of the war, the consequences of the war and then we have the Babylonian captivity of the Jews. After that we get to see the three Hebrew children namely Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah and how they started training for Nebuchadnezzar's service. Then we come to Daniel B which is again an interpolated section uh, fused to Daniel A. What we have in Daniel B is King Nebuchadnezzar's first dream and in this dream he dreams about a particular image a golden image and none of the chaldean wise men are able to interpret this dream so enter daniel and if you've read the bible again in school you must be familiar with the story daniel in the lions den so the daniel is the same this daniel and the daniel in the lions den they are both the same but in this poem you have no mention of that whole lions den story and daniel's courage and everything you do not have any mention of that Here we just have Daniel who eventually succeeds in interpreting Nebuchadnezzar's dream which none of the Chaldean wise men could. So what Nebuchadnezzar does next is he sets up this golden image and expects everyone to worship it. Now these three Hebrew children Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah they refuse to worship that image because for them it would almost be blasphemous to worship any kind of image other than their own god so they refuse to worship that image and what king nebuchadnezzar does as a result is he threatens to throw these children into a fiery furnace and kill them even this threat could not persuade the children to listen to nebuchadnezzar and actually go and worship the image so what the king does as a result is he carries out his threat and then we have you know azaria praying earnestly to god to save them from this ordeal and almost as if in response to azaria's prayer an angel comes down from heaven and rescues the children from the fiery furnace what follows is a song that is sung by these three youths a song which is mostly in praise of god and then we have king nebuchadnezzar's second dream which is once again interpreted by daniel and this is what how the poem basically goes on there are many songs by these three youths in praise of god for actually saving them from the fiery furnace uh and then uh what you need to remember is that the source of daniel 
uh, both Daniel A and Daniel B is not the Vulgate, it's rather a canticle that is preserved in the Vespasian Zalter. Now scholars are of the opinion that the interpolated section Daniel B was actually taken from another poem which was called Azaria and this is a poem that we find in the Exeter book not the Junius manuscript, the Exeter book, which is another Anglo-Saxon manuscript, which preserves Anglo-Saxon literature. There are several gaps in the poem. There are several missing pages, leaves. So again, the poem as we have it is not a very complete one. Then we move on to Christ and Satan. We find this poem Christ and Satan in the second book of the Junius manuscript. Once again, this poem has no name in the manuscript. And this poem is divided into 12 fits. So let me just uh, tell you about the contents of this poem. It starts off with the creation of mankind, uh, the fall of the angels, the fate of the fallen angels and we have five laments by Satan in this poem. Five long laments by Satan. So Satan is lamenting like anything in this poem guys. Just remember that and what is special in this poem and what distinguishes this poem from Genesis A and Genesis B are Christ's harrowing of hell. Now, what is Christ's harrowing of hell, you ask? Basically, Christ going down to hell and saving some of the condemned souls and taking them up to heaven with him. This is Christ's harrowing of hell. And then Christ giving a speech to these souls that he has rescued from hell and taken up to heaven with him. And what are the contents of the speech? In the contents of the speech, Christ basically talks about the creation of man, which is attributed to the son, not the, not God the father, but God the son. So Christ basically created mankind. That is what he talks about. And then the fall of mankind. And then how he wants to save mankind, his reincarnation and earthly life. And then the passion of Christ, the ascension, the resurrection, the Pentecost, uh, Judas's betrayal of Christ. And then everything that happened to him, basically, you know the story already if you've read the dream of the Rood. He also talks about his kingdom in heaven. And the fact that the men who were now salvaged after Christ, you know, gave up his life for mankind, how they can enter the kingdom of Christ too. Then he also talks about the doomsday. Then suddenly out of thin air, he starts talking about uh, his temptation in the wilderness, the temptation that was supposedly provoked by Satan, but how ultimately Satan failed to tempt Jesus Christ and how when Satan went back to hell like a loser, all the other fallen angels, so basically Satan's company, they started hurling insults and curses on Satan for failing to tempt Christ. This is what the content of Christ's speech is. So this poem is basically a lesson to mankind that you should never follow the path of Satan, but always follow the path of Christ if you want to be saved. And what is different about this poem and sort of disappointing is that Satan has been portrayed as a very sorry figure in this poem. Uh, he's always lamenting and moping around, you know, this is the way Satan has been portrayed in this poem, which is very much different from how Satan had been portrayed in Genesis B. So there Satan was proud and indomitable. And here Satan is this crybaby sort of a character who is always crying and, you know, moping around and lamenting. We have five laments by Satan in this poem. And then this poem also, you know, exemplifies how uh, exemplifies uh, Christ's rejection of Satan's temptation and basically it's a lesson for all human beings what they should do in the face of temptation. There are no known sources of this poem. Scholars believe that this poem was written with a very free hand and mostly from memory so the poet did not have any sources or scriptures or anything in front of him when he was writing this poem but mostly he was jogging up his memory and writing this poem so it's very freely written very freely and lucidly written and scholars also like find it hard to believe that Cademan was the one who composed this poem. They believe that uh, this poem was composed by a clerk who belonged to the school of Cademan, but who also was influenced by the Seinwolfian school, the school of Seinwolf. 
and that is what we are going to take up in the next video so if you've liked this video and if you think this has helped you this has added to your knowledge in any way then definitely do give it a big thumbs up subscribe to my channel uh, and hit the bell icon so that you get regular notifications whenever i upload a new video stay tuned for the next video in which i'm going to discuss about the school of sign wolf and certain works that are attributed to the school of sign wolf